My name is Valentin Schraghi. I'm a PhD student at MIT and I work in the Julia lab on heterogeneous and accelerated computing, distributed computing, HPC, what give it. I'm going to talk about a project that I've been working on for the last couple of months called Kernel Abstractions or How Not to Write CPU Code. Kernel Abstractions came about as part of a collaboration um, called the Climate Machine, which is working on writing a next generation climate model all in Julia. GPUs are good targets for certain classes of scientific computing, as an example, fluid simulations, climate simulations, machine learning, anything that is a stencil like operation really shines on a GPU. But we also need a performance portability layer because we have to target multiple different kinds of GPUs. We have to target um, CPUs as well, but we want really excellent performance on GPUs because they are what is driving uh, many modern supercomputers and that is where most of the flops are. But we can't leave the CPUs behind. We want to get at least decent enough performance on CPUs. Uh, I originally worked on a project called GPU File Loops that had uh, some of the same ideas, but it also had semantics that made implementing multi-threading support very hard. And so we went back to the drawing support, uh, drawing board, and looked at what do we need to change. And so that's how kernel abstractions came about. Um, in general, um, Julia has already a rich ecosystem to programming GPUs. You can go to juliagpu.org and see. Um, our support for CUDA um, hardware as well as the upcoming AMD support and Tim Bizarre is working on Intel support. In general, most CP GPUs uh, use a spin deprogramming model where you write the program for a single lane and that lane is ex that program is executed over a range of elements, data elements. The NVIDIA calls this confusingly enough a thread. Um, groups of these lanes are jointly executed as warp or vectors or wavefronts. And so there's a lockstep execution for these lanes and uh, for these lanes in a warp, and the warp on a NVIDIA GPU is 32 byte. Execution is organized into blocks or groups, and those can access shared resources. And these shared resources are actually um, critical, important uh, for our success later on. GPUs are also throughput oriented, so. Instead of looking at the pure latency operation, one might want to look at the memory utilization and how much of the bandwidth is eff effectively utilized. And when you're writing GPU code, you need to take into account the memory architecture and you need to very carefully look at your bandwidth usage. So my first attempt really almost three years ago was just to say, well, you know, we have a function f and we want to execute that function f over a range of indices um, and that is a spin deprogramming model. Do we need anything else? Should be good enough for us. And so I wrote up this little prototype and uh, this is the execution model for the GPU, a CPU where we just say, okay, we're gonna use a threaded execution, which will chunk this up in blocks and execute it um, on this, uh, the available threads on your CPU. And for the GPU, well, we can just write a, a very simple wrapper kernel, which we call the function f and calculate the thread index, uh, the lane index of, uh, that we're going to operate over. This had a couple of obvious issues. The first thing is really that the argument, the first argument is special. It's used for dispatch to select the implementation, and it's also used to describe the iteration space. But what if that is some static data? What if we uh, want to have more flexibility in the iteration space. Um, the second point is that we really had limited indexing. You could only use linear indexing and um, you were, it was derived from the, uh, the first argument. And also the semantics differ on the, G on the CPU and the GPU. On the GPU, the code will be executed asynchronously. So you will launch the kernel and then you will continue executing your CPU code. But on the CPU, we will wait. Um, and so that can lead to programming bugs that makes it harder to compare implementations. Uh, we have some similar code uh, in gpuarrays.gl, 
local GPU call that's been used for a couple of generic implementations. Okay. Um, but there are some less obvious uh, downsides that really sync this approach. The first one is that the common performance limiter is memory bandwidth and memory bandwidth usage. So how do I use my memory bandwidth effectively? Well, I want to reuse memory loads between kernels. That means I need to fuse them. But if I need to fuse them, I need to communicate results between them. And that might mean I need to communicate results between different lanes. And so I have to use the memory hierarchy on the GPU and use shared memory, local memory, to communicate between different lanes in inside the same clock. Um, so this is our first kernel abstraction code. It is implementing the transpose operation. Um, and so it's copying data from A B to A. We um, declare a kernel abstractions kernel uh, with the add kernel keyword. We can mark um, input arguments as const. There is a contract to the compiler where we're saying that um, B and A count alias and B will ever be will only ever be read from. Um, we can calculate our index. So we are using a spindly programming model and we have to first instantiate our code for execution on a CUDA device with a certain block size and then we can launch the kernel and we can execute the kernel over a given ND range. Um, and the programming model is asynchronous, so each kernel launch returns an event and so far we have to wait on the event. The, add ker the lang kernel language that is valid within add kernel um, contains a couple of words, as I mentioned, const, um, add index, add local mem to access um, shared memory, um, add synchronize to make sure that all writes to that local memory are visible um, to all other threads, add uniform to hoist a variable and to declare it as unchanging across lanes, um, add private to uh, allocate a private block of registers pair lane and then add print for unified printing from devices. So indexing um, is an interesting like set of vocables. Uh, you have global indexing that you can use to access um, global data like the input arguments A and B that we had previously. The group index will tell you which clock you're executing, which group you are executing, and the local index will tell you which index within that group you are. But you can also get it in different forms. You can get it as a Cartesian index, an n-tuple, and a linear index. And these are really just Julia constructs that you can always use. After you have written your kernel, you need to instantiate it. So you first need to instantiate for a compute device. As we've seen, we chose the CUDA device. Um, you need to decide whether or not you have a static or dynamic workgroup size. Um, the same thing goes for the ND range, the range that you're going to execute over. Then you need to call the kernel with arguments, the dynamic parameters, and the dependency list. Um, so if you're looking at our transpose kernel, again, we have the device as our CUDA device, the workgroup size is 32 by 32. Since we provided at instantiation time, it is static. Our ND range is provided as a dynamic parameter, and therefore is uh, dynamic. And our dependency list for now is nothing. And then at the end, we, have, we will wait on the event. What we could have passed, if we had a, a, a sequence of calls, we could have passed this event into the dependency list. So, and the ND range gives me an execution space to, um, for the kernel to run over. And so we will take this uh, 16 by 16 ND range and we will partition it by four by four blocks. And so we will get four blocks of four by four. But what happens when we have um, an ND range that is not evenly divisible by the workgroup size? Well, then we have iterations that operate over the edge um, and that are partially turned off. As you might have noticed, each kernel produces an event token. It is asynchronous. Um, and each kernel also takes a list of dependencies. So before we can read from the memory that a kernel provides, we need to wait on it, either through, uh, through a dependency or through the explicit wait keyword. So if you look at this sequence of events where we have 
um, we refer to a transpose and then a matrix multiply and we um, white to A and then we read from A and white to C. Um, we can see that these are the dependency edges that we're carrying along. This event is, uh, corresponds to this and after we waited on this event we can look at C. And this event is used as a dependency edge here and so while this transpose kernel is, uh, is writing to A, um, we can read from here safely. If we didn't provide these dependencies and events, we wouldn't have any, order, any guaranteed order and we might have any other reordering. So this is the one that we would have wanted maybe, um, but kernel abstraction would have been perfectly happy and fine to choose the complete inverse of that um, execution order. First look at C, which have not, has not been written to. Then do a matrix multiply with A, which where A might be just empty or garbage data, and then execute the transpose. But even worse, um, kernel abstraction might choose to just overlap these executions, and so um, we would get into the business of having a transpose corrupt A while um, white to A while we are also reading from um, A in our matrix multiply. Um, we sometimes have to integrate with um, legacy code um, provided by GPU arrays or CUDA.gl. And so CUDA.gl is synchronized, is, is using um, uh, uh, a, the Q default stream to synchronize operations. And so a CUDA kernel will be pl placed on that stream and then executed uh, one after another. Um, so we need to be a little bit careful when we uh, have a situation where we are mixing codes and so we need to introduce an event that is using the CUDA device as a target to create a barrier on the Q default stream which says everything up in CUDA.gl needs to finish before I execute my kernel and um, then you need to place a barrier onto the Q default stream that says Nothing can start before I have finished. So if you look at a little diagram of this, let's say we want to do a, uh, we have a podcast operation and um, we want to make sure that we don't have a data race on A. We first need to place an event on the Q default stream. Um, we need to wait on it um, in kernel abstractions. And then we need to wait on the output of kernel abstractions in the Q default stream before we use it again to do a mem copy as an example. Um, we're going to look in more detail to motivate why a really kernel abstractions exists and what it does and how it, how it operates um, at a fast transpose, which is taken from the uh, developer uh, NVIDIA page. Um, we're focusing on square matrices that are multipliers of 32. Um, we're going to operate in blocks of 32 and we're going to use shared memory. We are amortizing the cost of index calculation by processing four elements per thread. That makes our index calculation quite a bit more complicated than normally. Um, and as a bonus, we are going to avoid shared memory conflicts, but I won't have the time to talk about that in detail. Um, first of all, Kernel extraction has a couple of neat tricks uh, up its sleeve. So as an example, we have an unroll macro, which will tell LLVM that we would like a loop to be unrolled. Um, we will use a tile dimension and a plot rows, um, which is our group size. And the tile dimension will be 32 um, and the plot rows will be eight. But we will be operating in tiles of 32 and this plus one really is just here to avoid um, um, to avoid conflicts uh, with the shared memory controller. And so if you remove it, you will get very different performance behavior, um, which I would encourage you try, to try out. Um, we will first get our local index and our group index um, as an n-tuple. And then we will have to calculate our um, global index. But because we are iterating over blocks of 32,8, but our tiles that we actually want to work with are 32,32, we are having a compressed ND range. And so um, we can't just use at index global and rather have to do the calculation ourselves. Um, then we read 
uh, in a coalesced fashion multiple rows of memory into our tile. We synchronize. We then transpose our indices again, um, uh, the block offsets, and then we white um, into the output also in a block in a row by row, um, and um, we uh, transpose the tile indices. And so since tile memory is very fast, shared memory, local memory is very fast, it doesn't really matter that these axes are not coalesced, but these axes, the big global axes, are coalesced, and therefore they are rather fast. We have a harness around this code that um, we execute uh, for uh, Q matrices, and we make sure that we have a square that all of the arithmetic will end up and we will compress our Andy range um, so that we get the right number of blocks. So before we look at the performance analysis and how to do a performance analysis of this code, let's talk about a little bit how do we execute this on the CPU. Let's take a simpler function that I can fit on one screen um, that will just white to local memory and then read from local memory and has a synchronized statement in the middle. Um, this code on the CPU will expand into uh, a series of for loops and the synchronize denotes the end of a for loop. So we copy the indices into um, the body of the for loop and um, now you might see why we need an at uniform statement because if I didn't have an at uniform statement, I would have said n equals port group size inside the first loop, and then I would have gotten an undefined variable error in the second loop. So the at uniform really just says it is safe to execute the statement outside these uh, loops over the work group. I need to be a little bit more careful. There is a bounce check in here at each loop. Uh, to make sure that we are not executing code um, that would be illegal to execute. So, performance measurement, we can write a very short harness uh, where we launch a couple of um, transpose in a row so that we can see the spread of the execution. Um, we need to choose a big enough problem size. When I first looked at this problem, I, I lost uh, a couple of hours of sleep just because um, I looked at a 16 by 16 uh, matrix and that really is too small. Um, 1024, 2048, yeah, that is okay. It's still rather small, um, so bigger data is better for the GPU in general. Um, and we use the CUDA profile infrastructure and the NVTX range annotation to get a bit nicer output in the profiling. Um, and then we can use the new uh, NVIDIA Insight tools to um, look at a couple of different sections. This um, J here is a mistake. Um, but we're going to look at memory workload analysis and we're going to look at speed of light. Um, in general, the output that we will get, I've looked at a couple of different kernels in order to um, understand the performance of my transpose kernel a little bit better. And so I first looked at a baseline that used the shared memory um, to do a memory copy. And that yielded a memory throughput of about 783 gigabytes per second. Now the question is, is this good? Is this bad? Really, um, you can only answer by looking at something like the speed of light report where you see that you're using about 86% of memory bandwidth available. Um, shouldn't a memory copy be faster? Well, um, empirically speaking, while NVIDIA GPUs have about 900 gigabytes um, of memory uh, throughput, per, uh, um, theoretically, in reality, um, the best one can do is 790, empirically measured. Um, our naive transpose performs quite a bit worse, and that is because while one memory read is coalesced, the memory whites are strided, and so the performance is quite a bit worse there. 
Um, if we didn't add the funny plus one in our kernel, we would have had bank conflicts. And we can see that the performance would have been a little bit better than our original transpose, but really not worth the effort we put into writing that kernel. Um, adding that signal plus one um, improves the kernel performance quite uh, drastically to 676 gigabytes. And uh, if we are looking at the, the results together, we can see that our empirical performance um, is about 790 gigabytes. We achieved 783, which is quite good. And um, our coalesced transpose was 676. which is about 86% of peak. Um, if you want to look at the code that is being generated with Cthulhu, you have to dig a little bit into the implementation details and I have to, uh, I, I'm hopefully be able to provide a little bit of a better interface than this right now but you can also see how we are actually partitioning um, the data and we are using cassette in order to um, to change the semantics of the kernel underneath it. Um, the upcoming features that I'm, I hope to work on is a vectorization of C cheap CPU code. Right now there Every iteration is doing a bounce check, and so uh, that destroys vector vectorization ability. I want to improve debuggability, so add better Cthulhu support, um, but also due to the heavy use of macros and um, a certain amount of sloppiness on my part, all of the stack trace and error messages just point into the Netherlands. Um, uh, I also want to add inbuilt performance analysis to understand the performance on the CPU much better and in much detail. Um, and as always, um, documentation is a much needed, uh, needs much improvement. Um, if you want to, you can contact me. I'm at Vishuravi on all relevant uh, social media platforms. Um, and the whole project couldn't have happened without my collaborators. Um, from the climate uh, machine project as well as the Julia lab um, and the Juba Proda Julia community.